intriguing event for you this evening, featuring Philip Zelikow and his new book, The Road Less Traveled. Phil has had several accomplished careers as an attorney, a diplomat, and an academic. He's worked on international or national security policy in five administrations, from Reagan to Obama. And among the governmental projects he's most known for is his time as executive director of the 9-11 Commission. His association with the University of Virginia, where he's a professor of history and of governance, goes back more than 20 years. And much of his academic work has focused on history and the practice of public policy, as well as on terrorism and national security issues. In The Road Less Traveled, Phil goes back a century and examines one of history's great what might have beens, which is to say, what if Woodrow Wilson, who was eager to mediate between Germany and Britain in late 1916 and 1970, had actually managed a negotiated end then to World War I, almost two years before hostilities actually stopped. The idea is tantalizing in large part because the positive consequences for history would have been enormous. Not only would it have meant the saving of hundreds of thousands of young lives, but also quite possibly a world without the subsequent rise of Bolshevism and fascism, without the violent decomposition of the Austro-Hungarian domains and Ottoman Empire. A fascinating story that Phil tells in his deeply researched book is one of significant possibilities and missed opportunities for peace. And Phil makes clear that there's much blame to go around among the warring powers. He assigns the greatest share of blame to Wilson. And we're about to hear why in a minute. Now, Phil will be in conversation with another a very distinguished former public official, Bob Zellick. Bob has served in such senior government positions as US Trade Representative and Deputy Secretary of State, and also headed the World Bank for five years. For the past decade, uh, he's been a senior fellow at Harvard's Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs, and he served on various boards and as a senior counselor uh, at Brunswick Geopolitical, an advisory service uh, of Brunswick Group. Uh, for those of you watching who are not familiar with how this virtual format works, although you're not visible to us, you'll still be able to ask a question if you'd like. To do so, just click on the Q&A icon at the bottom of the screen. The chat function also will be active. And in that column, you'll find a link for purchasing copies of The Road Less Traveled. So Phil and Bob, the screen is yours. So thanks uh, very much, Brad. Uh, and it's a real privilege uh, to be here with Phil. Um, I've had a chance to read this book um, and I've had a chance uh, to sort of see its evolution. And uh, it's a cracking good history. Uh, for those of you that enjoy uh, fine writing and a good story, uh, this is a superb book. Um, also, for those of you that really love to dig into history, I suspect from the scholar side, the notes are gonna be as interesting as the book because Phil comes up with some, some pretty big ideas. And before I have a chance to interview him, I just wanna mention kind of four big takeaways that I had that I, I hope this book gets wider attention because I think it'll broad sort of reevaluation. The, the first is, I think this book could really change how we view the history of World War I. For many of us that have read a lot about World War I, it focuses, they focus heavily on the military history, the sequences of the devastating campaigns, sort of the raw endurance. Um, and what Phil points out is that uh, from about 1916 on, the key powers were looking for ways to end the war. And so what this draws out is the idea of, of uh, the public diplomacy, the politics of diplomacy to the story of the war. And second, that prompts an important historical question, but also a policy one that we deal with even to today, which is how do countries move from war to peace? This is often politically hard, but if we think across our own lifetimes or discussions about Afghanistan today, it's a very relevant policy question. And third, I think this book will help add to understanding of Woodrow Wilson as a foreign policy leader. There have been stories about the lead up to the war in, for in the United States. So from 1914 to 1917, when the war waged, but the US wasn't part of it. Been a lot written on the Paris Peace Conference, the failure of the League of Nations. And now I think people will ask and historians will ask, 
could Woodrow Wilson have been a mediator of, of peace? And Phil draws out the fact that Teddy Roosevelt played such a role about a decade before with the Russo-Japanese War, for which he won the Nobel Peace Prize. And he played a similar role in the European context with the first Moroccan crisis of 1905 or 1906. So what can we learn from Wilson's missteps? And fourth, as Brad mentioned, this book opens the gate to speculation on a whole series of what might have been if Woodrow Wilson had been able to help negotiate a peace by early 1917. The Russian Revolution and Bolshevism, uh, the breakdown of, of uh, politics and life in Germany uh, in the 1920s and 30s, the end of the Austro-Hungarian, the Ottoman empires, and of course, the loss of more than a generation. So I'm gonna dig straight in. And then as Brad mentioned, we'll save time for some of your questions. So Phil, the obvious one, what brought you to write this book? I kind of stumbled across it. Um, I was working on a world history project with an old friend of both of ours named Ernest May, uh, the late great Harvard historian who passed away in 2009. And toward, in the late 2000s, not long before Ernie's death, we were working together on a world history project. And we were going back over this period of the World War. And it's interesting, May himself was one of the principal historians of the end of American neutrality. He had probably is one of the three foundational scholars on this, wrote one of the principal books along with Arthur Link of why American neutrality ended at the end of the 1950s. So he was uh, an expert on this issue. And we both actually uh, came back across the fact that the German government had made this secret peace move to Wilson to mediate an end of the war in August, 1916. And we uh, um, we then kind of both asked ourselves, why exactly did that fail? And we began pulling on that thread a little bit more. And then we uh, kind of stumbled across some reminders about the intense peace debates going on in the British government in the autumn of 1916. And we just began talking about this for a while and realizing that in fact, um, there was a whole issue here that actually deserved another really, really hard look. And coming from May, who had written on this um, 50 years earlier, that was an important, uh, and May died soon after. And I kept looking into this and basically just kind of pulling on this issue. It's as if um, I was stumbling around the Judean desert near the caves of Qumran and came across this old looking scroll and kind of, oh, that's a, that scroll has some old writing on it. And then I just kept, and then, goodness, there are these Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, and that was a little bit like this experience. Um, as we just kept working on it, we kept finding new evidence. I then kept finding evidence. And all of a sudden, a picture began to emerge that decoded all sorts of things happening in the American, German, British, and even French governments that individual scholars had seen pieces of, but had actually never put together. And uh, I began to realize that there was a gigantic and entirely secret story here of which historians before had only seen, had only glimpsed fragments. But when you actually unearth the whole story, it's, it's one of the great tragedies of world history. So, so let's unpack this story a little bit. Um, Prior historians believe that by 1916, the Kaiser was primarily a figurehead and that the military leadership really held the reins of power. And they assume that the civilian leader, leaders, such as Chancellor Bethmann Holweg, who, who you bring back uh, from the mists of time, were secondary at best. So what, what led you to conclude that Bethmann Holweg could have negotiated a peace in late 1916, early 1917, which as you recall was right before Germany uh, ups the U-boat game that, that draws the United States into World War I. Uh, it's a great question. Uh, and the first thing about that is, is uh, one of the fundamental problems in the historiography is that uh, very few of the American and even British scholars have really studied the German sources. And the German historians who actually know that work well have not, their work has not traveled much outside of Germany 
except for the famous work of Fritz Fischer, who was primarily concerned with the outbreak of the war. And then the famous controversies about Fischer's theory. And then the, the spillover of that was the militarists are in charge, the annexationists are in charge, all of that. Except in 1916, it wasn't true. Uh, the, mili and, and, uh, the militarists have been pushing since the spring of 1915 for unrestricted submarine warfare. Uh, Bettmann Holweg, who had kind of been riding the militarist current at the outset of the war, put, dug in his heels and began resisting. So Phil, remind us who Bettmann Holweg is. Bettmann Holweg is the chancellor of Germany. So he is the leader of the entire civil, he is the foreign minister. He is the leader of the whole civilian government of the German empire. He coordinates the complicated structure by which Germany worked with all the component states in something called the Bundesrat. Um, he was the liaison to the German parliament, the Reichstag, and he was the civilian liaison to the Kaiser. So, but to, um, and then expand a little bit, does he have control over the military or how does that work? He does not. Uh, the, the way Germany was set up then, it was a bifurcated structure in which the head of what they call, would call the political branch, the chancellor reported to the Kaiser, um, and the commanders of the army and Navy reported directly to the Kaiser. And the heads of the army and Navy, the military couldn't give orders to the chancellor and the chancellor couldn't give orders to the military. And if there were differences between them, only the Kaiser could adjudicate. Okay, and the so Kaiser, meanwhile, it was an increasingly withdrawn and neurotic fig uh, person, a figurehead, except for occasional interventions to adjudicate these sorts of disputes. And actually, uh, Bettmann had not only headed off the military, he had in 1916 gotten the leading member of the Navy, Admiral von Tirpitz, famous name, he'd gotten him fired. He'd gotten the head of the army, uh, a Field Marshal von Falkenheim, also fired. He then engineered a new leader for the army, a man named Paul von Hindenburg and his aide Ludendorff, but he brought von Hindenburg in as a popular figure in order to provide, in order to help manage what Bettmann called a face-saving peace, a compromise peace, and with a new popular field marshal in charge, I can manage the compromise peace, as which the Kaiser then authorized him to negotiate during the summer of 1916 and which was the top priority of the German government for the next five months. So what and meanwhile, Bettmann is resisting the military pressure uh, for a long, long time until finally the Germans um, giving up on the peace move because they'd given up on Wilson, the military can regain the upper hand really for the first time in a year and a half. So just a little bit more, given the fact that he didn't control the military, his channels to the Kaiser, the Kaiser's sort of a weak uh, sort of figure. What led you to conclude that Bethlehem Holweg could have achieved a peace? Oh, um, well, first the Kaiser had formally approved the move. Um, not only did the Kaiser formally approve the move, he approved the move understanding that the Germans were gonna offer to restore Belgium in order to show their good faith. All he was, he approved all of that in crucial conferences at the end of July, 1916. Uh, Bettmann then makes his move with Wilson, formal proposal secretly from the Imperial government to the president of the United States, unconditional, mediate peace, throws in after that, oh, and by the way, um, we're willing to restore Belgium to show our good faith. The Americans hadn't even asked for that. Further, then in October, the military makes another push the Kaiser knocks the military back in October saying, we're not gonna do anything to mess with the Americans while we're trying to make peace. Then the Kaiser increasingly impatient himself wrote a letter to Wilson in October, 1916, pleading with the American president to quickly find a way to end the war. So the Kaiser actually is, is himself joining the effort to seek an end to the war. And one of the reasons Bettmann then begins to uh, lose his grip in January of 1917 is because the Kaiser himself is increasingly disillusioned with Wilson and is coming to the conclusion that Wilson is hopeless. Uh, the chancellor has not given up hope. 
And then at the very end of the story, you actually have literally simultaneously on the same day, two diametrically opposed messages delivered to Wilson, one from the military about submarine warfare and one from the chancellor divulging Germany's secret peace terms so that Wilson might revive the peace talks. So and then it, Wilson reacts. So then the other really key country here is, is Britain. And as you talk about, um, there's a political transition here in the coalition government. So Asquith gives way to Lloyd George. Lloyd George is a political fox. Uh, he, while he'd hinted at negotiations um, earlier, uh, by late 1916, he maneuvers to lead a new coalition as uh, Mr. Fight to the Finish. Um, so why would he sell? And, and was he really perhaps just trying to pull the US into the war, which would have been another strategy? Yeah, the, um, first, uh, Lloyd George would have had no choice but to end the war very soon uh, because uh, the great secret on the British side, which they, which they kept secret, including, frankly, from most historians uh, to this day, is that they were actually about to go bankrupt in the dollars to sustain the war. Um, uh, I think the evidence on this is just overwhelming. If, if, if you dig into it, including the evidence that we have from working in the files of their banker in the United States, uh, J.P. Morgan and Company, um, and the British knew this, and Lloyd George knew this. So Lloyd George privately, by the way, is uh, um, completely defeatist about Britain's chances in the war. But he, he has a public image of I'm Mr. Fight to the Finish in order to conduct the political maneuvers to bring down the Asquith government, which was very pessimistic about how to end the war. Even though privately, Lord George is leading the faction that is condemning how the war is being conducted. So there, there are really two things going on for Lloyd George and his schemes in early 1917. One, he's wondering whether or not he can actually change all the military strategy to basically quit offensives on the Western Front and reopen some whole new front in the Balkans or in Italy. All those efforts on his part, by the way, are completely impractical and they will all fail in the spring of 1917, but he doesn't know that yet. But he is, gam but mainly at the same time that he thinks he can change the whole military strategy, which he can't. Um, he's actually hedging against that by trying to reach out to Wilson to establish a secret channel to make a peace move and to negotiate peace if his gambit fails. Um, because in addition to all of that, in the back, Lloyd George knows, he knows very well that Britain is about to run out of money. And actually the dollar bankruptcy in January, 1917 is probably only about six weeks away. It's just, and, and incidentally, Russia is also about to implode into revolution in six weeks. So all that's about to happen. In fact, Lloyd George has made himself prime minister with a public promise that belies his secret knowledge. But with that secret knowledge, he's trying some gambits to make things work better. But if they don't, he's getting ready to fall back on a negotiated peace, knowing he's about to run out of money. Okay, so as the story as you tell it, the, the, the Germans uh, want to have peace and they're willing to give up Belgium and perhaps other things in the process. Um, the British posture is they know they really need peace, uh, but they're sort of trying to maneuver to the mediation. We know that Woodrow Wilson wanted to mediate a peace. So here's the big question. Why, why didn't Wilson and his top advisors launch a serious peace negotiation um, and achieve a summer. No, and this is part of the great tragedy. And in a way, the introduction made it sound like I blame Woodrow Wilson and an important part I do, but um, that's really part of the whole tragedy of the story because the portrait of Woodrow Wilson in my book, as you know, in many ways is very positive. Um, I see Woodrow Wilson's overall strategic perception of the war as fundamentally sound and very perceptive. Um, Wilson's juggling between the interventionists and the pacifists in American politics. He knows that the only way out of the war is a, what he called a peace without victory, a compromise peace. He is eager to mediate it. 
in a way, the banal problem is not that Wilson doesn't see the goal, not that he has the wrong grand strategy, not that the sides are irreconcilable. The problem is kind of bluntly, Wilson doesn't know how to do it. He literally at the operational level, as you've actually called out in your recent book, at the operational level, he just doesn't know what I'm supposed to do to set up a peace move. So he's, he does a couple of things that are great. He writes a letter, secret letter to the British warning them that they need to compromise. He then yanks on their finances to give them a financial heart attack and let them know he can dominate their finances, which works, by the way, completely works. But then he tries to figure out how to launch the peace move. He writes a proposal that actually has proposal for a conference in it, but then he's persuaded to take the conference proposal out and instead uh, make a move uh, after, uh, after being delayed and deflected by his advisor on whom he unduly relies, Edward House. Um, he makes a move in mid-December that is a complete bust. It, 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 instead of calling for a peace conference, it asks everybody to name their terms, which is impossible for them to do publicly. After that fails, he tries some other things. He gets a, dipl a diplomacy going with the Germans. Uh, he and House then screw that up. He then gives a speech, the Peace Without Victory speech, which is a wonderful in its goals, but it has no operational side. And He's fumbling his way forward now, increasingly guided on what to do, not by anyone in his own government, from whom he's getting no good advice at all, and in fact, in some cases, active dissembling with uh, the dip British and German diplomats, but he's actually getting advice now from the, from the British intelligence agent in Washington, the German ambassador in Washington, and even Herbert Hoover on how to do this, and he's slowly beginning to figure out what he's supposed to do when the Germans run out of patience. And the, well, the German military and the Kaiser run out of patience, uh, even though Bettmann is still trying to keep it alive. Well, you also point out, I think, uh, in a powerful way that all the key parties realize that once a peace conference is convened, that it'll be impossible to go back to war, given like the, the war will end. Um, and you also draw out this point that I think is applicable for people thinking about diplomacy today, that we know Woodrow Wilson from these ex extraordinary speeches and vision. And actually he's not bad at the tactics in 1914 to 17, and he's quite good at it in domestic politics. It's this missing piece. And in part, it reminds people that we didn't have much of a diplomatic establishment. One of the, one of the aspects of your story that's quite striking is you have to really look hard to find the Secretary of State and the State Department and House is there as a part-time national security advisor, I guess, doing right this kind of amateurish dilettante. So, um, so, so you've been a policy uh, advisor and actor. So let's take this a, a step further. So let's take you back a hundred years, and now you're actually advising Woodrow Wilson. What might uh, of a of a notion of a peace settlement would have would have been possible? So. For people thinking about this book and trying to understand how this diplomacy could have worked, how might it have turned out? And there's one other piece that I think you draw attention to, again, useful today. You draw the distinction between sort of an armistice to end the fighting and then the settlement. So you're advising Wilson. What's it look like? Yeah, there's actually a little chapter in about the middle of the book where I sort of take a time out. The chapter is called How to End a Great War and take time out to kind of uh, let's just take stock here and think about if you were advising the American government, knowing what you could have known at the time, here's how you could have advised them. And this is a particularly neat point for a politics and prose audience. I am sure that among the people watching this conference right now, there are people who are knowledgeable enough about policy or even diplomacy or negotiations who will read this book. And when they get to that midway point, it will be totally clear to them how to do it too. <laughs> they, uh, it, it is not. It was not rocket science to figure out how to do this. Um, and what you would do is you would say, okay, each of the sides here need to have a success story as to how they're winning this war, as to why ending the war now will be a success. And the story that all of them need to tell is a story of self-defense. 
You see, because all, the, all of their peoples believe they're fighting the war for self-defense. The Germans, by the way, Betmann, who incidentally, in addition to bring along the Kaiser, he is, he's actually coordinated this with Germany's allies, Austria-Hungary, Turkey. He's also reached out to the key political factions in the German landscape and already briefed them and has brought along the, the political coalition he needs. And the he story he point. uses... He uses a wonderful historical analogy, yes. which is uh, to the Seven Years' War and how, Correct. how, how uh, Frederick the Great managed to have a negotiation that saved Prussia at that time and uses right. that politically. Right. The, the whole narrative that Bettman has figured out politically is the same narrative they would all have used. In the German case, it's a narrative of Germany has survived, thank God. You see, in the German mindset, in their image, Germany is encircled by enemies who want to destroy it. A successful peace is one in which Germany fends off the encircling enemies and survives and successfully defends itself, above all from the Russian invasion that had come into Germany at the beginning of the war, uh, which mostly Americans and British readers don't even know about. But the French had that same narrative. France was invaded by Germany. We have succeeded in forcing the Germans to leave France we have defended ourselves, we have blunted the German spear. The British had the same narrative because the Germans were willing to give up Belgium. Britain could say, we fought the war in order to repel German aggression. The British shield has blunted the German spear. They had to give up their conquests. They had to withdraw from Belgium. You see, we have shown aggression did not work. They all had that story. But none of them could individually propose it because the depth of mistrust and hostility was so great. They were all looking to Wilson to break the ice and, show, and, and basically offer the conciliation at the peace conference. They could all have their narrative of successful self-defense. Now, Germany, since it actually held a lot of the ground, had in a way almost to go first and show that it was willing to give up some of its territory to make that narrative work. And that's why the Germans offered to restore Belgium. And they put that on the table for the Americans to use before the Americans even asked for it. Um, and, and their ambassador told uh, uh, Wilson and House again and again, look, we're willing to give up Belgium. We're willing to withdraw from occupied France. We're basically willing to go back to the pre-war borders. Um, as he put it, he literally said, in November 1916, peace is on the floor waiting to be picked up. Okay, so Professor Zellico, you're back on the NSC staff. You got all these components. You're writing the memo for President Wilson. What did he do wrong? Uh, he, gave an, he gave a good speech. He offered to bring the parties together. What, what, what did he miss? He didn't offer to bring the parties together. Ah, ah. He, uh, it seems like such an obvious thing. In a way, all he needed to do is arrange the peace conference. Now in arranging the peace conference, I go into some detail how to do this. He could have taken 30 minutes to understand how Theodore Roosevelt had arbitrated the Russo-Japanese war, really like a 30 minutes or even an hour, um, which like, or someone at the State Department could have written one page about that for him. No one at the State Department in this whole story wrote literally so much as one page on how to do a negotiation to end the war, even though they knew this is what the president wanted to do. And they had months of notice that he was going to move on this the instant he was reelected, which he totally wanted to do. So um, he, he's trying to figure out what to do. He's very good tactically at how to write diplomatic notes in the submarine diplomacy but he has no idea how to choreograph a peace conference. So he's, he actually first writes out a note himself. No one drafts it. He writes the peace note out himself that includes the call for a peace conference. And then Edward House says, oh, you need to take that out. Um, because uh, just to ask them for what their, just to ask them for what their, their peace goals are. Just to ask them to and see, if, see if their goals happen to coincide take out that call for a conference. Indeed, tell them you're not trying to mediate at all. Because see, House was worried that the British would be infuriated at the talk of a compromise peace, not knowing that in fact, at that very moment, 
the British were tormenting themselves over whether to end the war and seek a compromise peace. Uh, and so Wilson goes along with that, not knowing better. And so in effect, he simply, will all of you please state your war aims? To which he gets these bewildered responses. And then after that, he decides to give a speech stating America's conditions to be part of a peace negotiation, but he never calls for a peace conference. He never tries to arrange it. He never says, if you, for the Germans, for the Germans to come to this peace conference, for example, um, we will set as a precondition German willingness to withdraw from Belgium, to show their good faith. We can try to then draw armistice lines that would kind of codify a ceasefire line while the negotiations are going on. We might then have a negotiation on whether the German submarine warfare and the Allied blockade would be suspended while the negotiations are going on. All, there are so many ways the Americans could have helped to set this up. And the Germans had given the negotiating leverage to Wilson to use for this. And he just didn't know how to do it. And then House, meanwhile, is lying to the Germans about Wilson's attitudes. Um, Really, so, the, so let's come, the story let's, is let's, almost so strange that I think readers will find it hard to believe. So let me press what would be an alternative perspective that a pro-British house might have had, or even a Teddy Roosevelt who had mediated before. They might say, this is a, this is a war about German militarism, and Germany is a threat to Europe. So if we start a peace conference, and Germany can make sort of not fine statements, but it's got the dominant position on the ground. It's right. got Belgium, it's got parts of France, it's got sort of Poland. As you talk about, most Americans don't focus as much on the Eastern part, but uh, the Austro-Hungary's got Serbia. They've just defeated Romania. So they're in a pretty strong position. And couldn't a pro-allied person say, look, if we start to talk peace, it'll stall and Germany will be left in a dominant position. We'll never be able to fight again. So from a strategic point of view, we have to push back on this imperial sort of German power. And therefore, I don't want my president to go forward with something that will allow the Germans sort of to escape what we have to do with them. And ultimately the US has to join the war, this view would go. So what's your counter to that? Yeah, well, um, they're basically, um, two positions uh, in the, and by the way, these are positions at the time. These are not uh, Zellico hindsight. This is, these are positions argued at the time in the autumn of 1916 at the highest levels of the British government. One, we need to end the war right now regardless. Why? Because we are killing off the best of Britain's youth and we are bankrupting the country and we need to end the war because if we don't end the war, we will lose it next year. Uh, Russia may go out of the war, a true prediction. Um, and, we, uh, and we will also run out of money. We're about to run out of the dollars to sustain the war effort, which will happen at the beginning of 1917, another true prediction. And at that point, we will actually lose the war. So if we can get a negotiated peace now, great. Then the second position said, no, no, you can't just quit and leave the Germans with the advantage on the battlefield. The Germans have to clearly give some stuff up so that this is a better looking compromise. That's the position of folks like Arthur Balfour. And here's the thing is that um, Balfour's position was attainable because the Germans were willing to restore Belgium. Belgium was the issue for the British public. At the, point that, at the point that the British government can go to the British people and say, the Germans are willing to talk peace as, a, as an earnest of their good faith, they're willing to restore Belgium and withdraw from what they've taken in Belgium and France. And we are willing to discuss a peace with them on that basis that can bring this war to an end. I think a lot of the British population would have been enormously relieved. And most of the British soldiery would have been relieved too as I show from evidence in the book. And indeed, the president of France would have been relieved as he secretly confided to Britain's king in August, 1916. So 
here's the choice. The choice isn't let's go on to victory. The choice is we can either go on and lose the war while also bankrupting our country and losing the flower of our youth, or we can try to continue at least so the Germans will give some stuff up. But the Germans were offering that leverage to Wilson to basically make that compromise. And then you're left with the alternative, oh no, we simply need to fight on to absolute victory even though our prospects of obtaining that victory are um, remote since we're gonna run out of the money and we have no military plan to win the war, to deliver the knockout blow. And at the moment to them, there was no prospect whatsoever that America would enter the war on their side. Uh, no one in the British government expected America enter, to enter the war on their side. Well, and since, since we've also just had St. Patrick's Day, it's worth recalling the Irish American and German American community um, and frankly, the blockade uh, that, uh, that Britain had uh, made Britain quite unpopular in 19. Oh, yes. Uh, the people forget the, <laughs> the high watermark of pro-Allied sentiment in America lasted for about a year from the sinking of the Lusitania in May 1915 until May 1916. But from May 1916 onward, um, American opinion was increasingly hostile towards the Allied side for continuing the war. So Phil, we're starting to get some good questions. I wanna fit two more in real quickly for you. Uh, one, um, you do something that few historians in general do and particularly of this period, which is that you combine a view of the financial and economic side with the security part. And you've touched on this a little bit, but do you wanna add any more comments about uh, that part of this, this story? I uh, know, you're, but you're so right. And among the things that people, have, have seen but have not put together, there are a few historians who realize that Britain was actually running out of money. You see, the whole theory of Britain winning, the Allies winning the war, is that as the war went on, a long war would favor them, that they could outlast the Germans with the blockade. And therefore, the greatest secret of the war, which the Germans didn't understand at the time fully, is actually that the, Brit, the Allied war effort was running out of the money to sustain it. Um, they were having to borrow dollars and, and the, by the way, they were borrowing dollars on cold commercial terms, having to actually de physically deposit collateral in New York banks in order to borrow the dollars. And the collateral was gold and marketable securities. And they were running out of both and visit and they were going to, the amount of dollars they were having to borrow in 1916 was larger than the size of the entire French war effort in the war. Like 40% of all the money of food and munitions was being borrowed in dollars. And they, had, they were running out of collateral to borrow the dollars. The Americans not only showed no interest in lending them, Wilson in November 1916, working through the Federal Reserve Board, essentially killed all unsecured loans to the British and French. He, the Federal Reserve Board on Wilson's secret direction cut off all unsecured loans. And at that point, it was really just a matter of time before the Allied war effort uh, ran out of the dollars to continue. So you may be reviving William Jennings Bryan because as you may know, in 1914, he actually told Wilson that money was the worst form of contraband and we should have not allowed loans. So in a sense, Wilson comes around to, to Bryan's point of view. So the last question I wanna ask, put this in a bigger context, uh, you've had an unusual career as both a historian and a policymaker. Um, and you've now done a series of, of policy decisions. You did McKinley's decision to annex the Philippines. You did a very interesting book that's not gotten the attention it should about, with Ernest May, about the Suez crisis of 1956. Uh, you've done the Cuban Missile Crisis of 62 and its relation to the Berlin crisis. You've done German unification and the decisions on world order that followed. And now this lost opportunity in 1916 and 17. So as you look across these cases, if we- And the 9-11 commission. <laughs> and the 9-11 commission. Do you have any insights you'd like to share about uh, your approach to presenting histories of such decisions? I do. Um, and actually, I think, again, for this particular politics and prose audience, some of whom are uh, maybe a few of whom have been in government or been close to it or Congress, um, it's this, is value the historian's microscope. 
Um, in a way, it's like thinking about uh, what we know about human disease and biology. Before we knew about germs and molecules and cells, all we know, knew about disease was what you could tell from gross anatomy. People looked sick <laughs> because we didn't know anything about germs or we didn't even know what a thing was called a virus. But then you have microscopes. You can look hard. It actually, when you use a microscope, there are a whole new world that opens up uh, and a whole new world of why, what causes things. And sometimes very big things have very tiny causes. That is true in these historical episodes over and over and over again is um, you've been through some of this yourself and uh, whether it's the Cuban Missile Crisis, the 9-11 story, um, German unification, yes, there are some big background circumstances, but if you actually turn in, tune in the microscope and are willing to really dig into the details at some key moments and look at all the evidence from the different sides, you can unpack a whole fascinating world that you didn't even know existed until you could see it. So we've got some great questions. And the first one is from Nancy Connors, and this shows the relevance of your book today. Her maternal grandmother was a young Belgian living in near Brussels during the war. And she would like to know, at any time did the King of Belgium have any agency or role in the progress of the war or the peace? Actually, he did. Um, there's, uh, there's a little bit about this in the text. There's more about it in the end notes. Um, because uh, the whole negotiation in 1916, the Germans were getting ready to restore Belgium. In order to restore Belgium, the Germans needed to restore Belgium's neutrality. You see, the trick was, if we restore Belgium, we need to be sure Belgium basically doesn't go back to being a French colony, so that the French army moves right to Liège and sits on the, right next to the Ruhr coal region of Germany. So ironically, since the Germans had violated Belgian neutrality, they are working on a negotiation with King Albert in 1916 to figure out how to guarantee Belgium goes back to being neutral again if you basically get out of Belgium and restore it. And those, there are very secret negotiations the Germans were conducting with King Albert during 1916 in order to set all this up. So that then when, when Bettmann tells Wilson, we are willing to restore Belgium, he's doing that in part because he's empowered by the negotiations he's conducting secretly with King Albert. Yeah, that's an interesting little sub story because it does underscore the seriousness of the German's effort that they were already having these discussions. So uh, Robert Nye, I believe is the pronunciation, if the, if the British were going bankrupt two years before the actual war ended, how did they sustain their war effort? Because America came in the war. I mean, it's just what the story, uh, Robert, is, uh, which I get into a little bit in the epilogue, is just is kind of astonishing. All the bad predictions that Britain would go bankrupt were true. And Britain, uh, actually, Wilson, at once Wilson broke diplomatic relations with Germany, he then tried to turn around the, the warning he'd given against unsecured loans, which they did in March 1917. This was not good enough. That still was not enough money. And finally, in the summer 1917, the British frantically went to say, like, we are within days of basically having to bank, uh, going bankrupt and having to curtail the whole war effort. Here, now, America at this point is an ally of Britain. And Britain is saying, if you don't help us uh, in a huge way, we're going to have to go bankrupt. So what the Americans did, it was no longer commercial loan world anymore. America could, the only thing America could do is open up the treasury and simply just give Britain all the dollars, loan Britain all the dollars it wanted with no security. So this flood of unsecured loans to the British from the United, directly from the United States government after the war began, which then as Bob knows very well, this whole huge book of loans from the US government to the British would then become this huge shadow over the peace. It would then be one of these great shadows over all the diplomacy of the 1920s because the British of course could never pay back those loans. 
So uh, as, as Phil mentioned, Robert, this is uh, the codicil that the history continues of that since France and Britain owed huge loans to the United States, they needed the reparations from Germany. And so now we're off to the Versailles peace process. And then later the, 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 the loans of the United States to Germany, so as to pay the reparations, so as to pay the French and British to pay us. So right. this was actually- The uh, whole spiral then is partly as a sequel to this story in this book. And, and the interesting insight was for the people who then rebuilt the system in 47 and 49, they learned this lesson and they recognized they didn't want to repeat it. Um, then we have another question that says, do you feel it was sabotage or incompetence in Wilson's advisors and staff? Um, re read the book and judge for yourself. Um, but the lawyers for both sides could make a good argument. Um, it is, Wilson himself, I think you will judge, um, is in some ways a very sympathetic figure. Um, and this is part of what makes the story so tragic, is he's so, he's so badly served. Now he realizes his Secretary of State, whom he regards as little more than, an, little more than a clerk, um, is pro-allied and wants to try to drag him into the war. And he almost fires his Secretary of State out of hand in, um, um, at a couple of different points, but it essentially just treats him as nothing better than a clerk. What he does not know, he does not know, is he doesn't know how much House is lying to people. And so then in a way, the whole puzzle of is, is House merely incompetent or was House willfully and purposefully undermining Wilson? Um, I think I put, the way I put it in the book at one point, and actually my editor asked me this question at one point when he was looking at the is House a villain or only a fool? <laughs> and I actually address this question in the book because I actually think he's some a bit of both. Um, because the, I think there, are, there is good evidence that can acquit House of the true purposeful Machiavellian villain charge. Um, his behavior just, does, is, not, is not consistent with the Machiavellian portrait. Um, and the, you can see the details in the book. But believe me, there is evidence there for the prosecution as well. I think, I think fool trumps villain, but it's, uh, there's evidence for both. Because I think above all, House, House was unwilling to do anything that would spoil his social standing in, in London, if I may put it bluntly. Yeah, I think that's an interesting point that you draw. For, for people to recall, he didn't have an official position. Um, in a sense, it's, it's an insight as to the interpersonal relations among diplomats or pseudo diplomats, and he clearly didn't want to lose favor in London. So Ralph Avery's got a two-part question uh, going to the details. Very good. It says, could the British have afforded to stop the blockade while discussing peace? And could the Germans have afforded to permit it to remain in place? I must say, I thought about this when I read it too. So was the blockade a deal breaker? And the second part, would the German military have permitted relinquishment of Belgium in the final analysis? Yeah, um, the, uh, those are great questions. You will love the book. <laughs> people, people who are thinking this way will totally get the book. It turns out your first question actually uh, was immediately flagged and began getting discussed at the highest levels of the British government in August, 1916. So they spotted this question and they actually began like in the armistice, do we lift the blockade? And the initial position was no, no, we've got to keep the blockade on the armistice to which some people then said, yes, but the Americans are gonna insist on us lifting it. And then they kind of left that unresolved. Um, but they, they noticed the issue and flagged it and were inclined to leave the blockade on because it would give them some additional leverage in the negotiations. And then this would have been an issue in the preliminaries. And then the Germans would have had, in my view, the trade you would negotiate is the, Brit the Germans would then offer to restore Belgium in exchange for Britain lifting the blockade as part of the armistice deal. That that would be, have been part of the preliminary deal to get you to the conference. That was the logical trade. And that would have been a very good trade from the British point of view. The second part of the question, would the Germans really have withdrawn from Belgium? Uh, I think the answer actually, the answer is twofold. One, yes, actually, yes. Why do I say that? Because um, A, Bettman, 
Bettman is already working on the arrangements to do it. And he's just he's clearly choreographing it. At one point, um, uh, one of the uh, conservative Germans starts telling uh, Bettman that we need to maintain our position on the channel. And Bettman just rounded on him furiously, you know, basically saying, are you crazy? Uh, do you sh are we going to fight forever? So Bettman is arranging. He's saying we'll do it. He is clearly making the arrangements to do it, including with the Belgian king. Um, he has a fallback position. If he can't get the neutrality assurances he wants, the Germans will occupy, want to retain the border fortress at Liège as a security for their border. So he's clearly working this out. So I think that's sincere. But here's the second part of the answer to that question. Suppose you, suppose you don't trust the Germans to do it. Suppose you don't believe Batman. Okay, then test it, then test it. That's what you do in diplomacy. This is okay, you say you're gonna do this, all right, let's sign the deal and, and, and see, if you'll keep your, see if you'll sign the deal, see if you'll keep your part of the bargain. And uh, the, the, so the whole, if, you don't, if you're not sure whether the Germans are willing to carry through on their promises, test them. That's the whole, what's what you do in diplomacy, as Bob knows very well. And if they'll either sign or they won't sign. But the notion that they'll put that on the table and then you won't even try to test it, well, that there's no defense for that position. So I, I think for readers, um, one of the wonderful things about Phil's work, and it's kind of a, it's a contrarian view that we both have compared to the tendency in foreign policy writing to often have big themes and grand strategy, is that the, the problem solving work in the operational art of diplomacy, how you structure these deals, how you test things is actually much more important than most of the daily discussion recognizes. And it's frankly where the rubber hits the road in, in reality and Phil's history draws it out. So, um, and then I've got another question for you. Uh, 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 Ralph did a quick follow up. He said, uh, whoops, he said, but war making capacity would have ended with an armistice. You want to address that? Yeah, and therefore where you draw the armistice lines would be very important. Um, in fact, uh, people at the time said this, it's, it's a terrific perceptive comment, is it's, it's basically as soon as they come out of the trenches, they'll never go back in. And so really once the peace conference gets going and therefore where you draw the armistice line is important. The British took this so seriously, one of them, um, a conservative uh, member of the cabinet named Lord Crawford actually even sent around a memo drawing where the armistice line would be. And then, uh, so negotiating, negotiating the terms of the armistice is where you have the ceasefire line. Do the Germans have to evacuate Belgium as a condition of the ceasefire? What do the British do in exchange? All that would have been part of, um, I think the armistice and the, and the calling of the conference that I think would effectively have ended the fighting for good. Yes. But so you would have ended the fighting for good with both sides having significant forces in being, and therefore you would have inevitably ended up with a compromised peace with all the countries involved fundamentally left intact, more or less on the pre-war borders, but probably with a new independent Poland. I would also guess that if the US were a key mediator, it would nudge in terms of opening markets because that was a frustration on the US side. Um, so uh, Doug Krozik, uh, sorry if I butchered your name, uh, it says, do you believe the election year of 1916 influenced any of Wilson's decisions concerning this situation? Um, what it did, the big effect of the election year uh, was that it simply delayed the onset of the talks and that was very fateful. Um, so from a political point of view, actually both parties running in 1916 agreed that America should not enter the war. Um, Brian was to Wilson's left but Theodore Roosevelt was to the right of Charles Evans Hughes, who was the Republican candidate and, and actually was a minority position in the Republican party. So both Wilson and Hughes were in favor of America staying out of the war, but Wilson certainly viewed the election outcome as a vindication, as a vindication of his stance on not getting America in the war. And in fact, he did not, he, if the German, if there had been small submarine disputes, Wilson would not have let those provoke them into the war either. And he said so, he and House said so to the, both the British and the Germans. But here's the thing to your question, Ralph. 
The Germans made their peace move in August. Question, why didn't Wilson then start, start all this process going in August? Why did he wait until, uh, and he waited until really his first day in the office after he was reelected? It was the first thing he was gonna turn. Wilson felt he could not launch the peace process during the campaign that it would have been seen as a political move. He felt he needed to wait until after he was reelected to start. And he literally started his first day back in the office. But by then you're already in the middle of November. You've lost now at this point, three months. Um, and you, the, this turns out to be very important in the chronology of the British politics. It also turns out to be important a little bit in the German politics because the Germans are getting more and more impatient and the militarists are banging at the door. Um, and bettmann has been holding them off, holding them off, but that just gets harder and harder with every passing month because the Germans are so eager to find some way of ending the war. And if you can't end it with peace talks, the military is saying they can end it with the submarine panacea. So, the delay in getting it for Wilson and getting his efforts going, which he then mangles for months and is slowly at the end of January, finally figuring it out. And he runs out of time. So runs Phil, speaking of, of running out of time, um, we've only got a couple minutes left. And there's there are two questions by Stephen Stodigal, if you would get a chance. What would have happened to Alsace if the war ended in 1916? And what would the post-treaty German government have been like? And then we'll have to close. Okay. Um, the uh, Alsace issue was being discussed super secretly at the time between France and Germany. This is another story I bring out that's not well known at all, but the, a few of the French historians know about this, like Georges Henri Soutou. So um, basically the idea was, is that we're going to have to have some face-saving compromise where maybe the Germans withdraw from a little bit of this, and then there are some parallel concessions the French will make about German access to the Brie Longui ore fields. It, they, and um, super secretly, Bettmann and the French Prime Minister Briand had sent emissaries to begin talking about the Alsace Lorraine problem in Geneva in the winter of 1916. Um, so, because as we know now from secret things that the French president said to the British king and other evidence, the French were also looking secretly to find a way out of this. Uh, they knew their country was at the end of its rope and they knew that they could not reconquer Alsace Lorraine on the battlefield. And so they, they all needed a face saving way out. As for the post a peace Germany, um, Bettmann's view, which is very interesting, was that when the veterans return home, there'll be a huge political change in Germany that the power of the Prussian militarists, what, the, what they thought of as the East Elbian elite, that their power would be uh, deeply reduced after the war and that Germany would go through a great political transition. Bettmann expected this and he wanted to try to preserve a constitutional monarchy in that transition and keep the country from descending into revolution. And he thought that ending the war now with a compromised peace was the best way of avoiding the revolution. Uh, by the way, a prediction that also turned out to be uh, pretty damn precedent. Okay, so there's a lot more. For those, you actually have to buy and read the book. Um, and on a number of these questions, uh, frankly, uh, make sure you pay close attention for the notes. For the types of these questions we have, the notes are almost as good as, as the real text. So Brad, turn it over to you. Yeah, great moderating, Bob. And, and Phil, you know, fast forwarding to today, one, ha one has to assume that unlike in Wilson's time, there are people in the current administration who are advising the president on, on how to end war. Uh, but I sure hope they, along with many others, read your book and, and learn from it, because it'd be a shame if we miss another opportunity at a historical turning point. Yes. Um, to everyone watching, uh, thanks for again uh, for tuning in. Uh, a reminder that in the chat, uh, you can uh, find a link to purchase The Road Less Traveled. From all of us here at Politics and Prose, stay well and well read. Thank you, Brad. Thank you, Bob. Thanks, Phil, for a great